Andy Mock joins us now. He's a senior research fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. That's a think tank based in Beijing. Andy, we started off uh, by talking a little, about a little bit of history, going back to 1978, Deng Xiaoping opening up and reform. But the reforms have also created this kind of transformation, and there's been an evolution there as well. Give us an idea of the advances we're seeing now in terms of China's digital transformation. Thanks for having me on, Mike. Well, if we look back to 1978 and Deng Xiaoping's reforms, one of the four modernizations was science and technology, which of course is what digitization is based on. And if we think back to those days, when we wanted to communicate, we had to put pen to paper, send a letter. If we wanted to watch a movie, we had to go to a movie theater because uh, digitization really is about moving atoms to bits or electrons. And think about how far uh, we've come uh, in China today. Uh, of course, we can communicate with WeChat, uh, other electronic messaging apps. Uh, we have payment solutions, digital payment solutions like WeChat and Alipay uh, that enabled e-commerce. Uh, so this has had a transformative uh, impact on the Chinese economy and Chinese society. And this has also rippled out all around the world as we're seeing uh, companies like Huawei, uh, like Douyin that makes TikTok, um, like uh, Alipay, other companies uh, having global digital impact. Yeah, and the tentacles of this transformation uh, go in just about every direction you can imagine, in, in many cases impacting almost every sector of society. Absolutely, Mike. And I like the word that used tentacles. Uh, I like to think of tendrils in that uh, the digital system, digitization, is like the a nervous system of a biological organism. So in the early days in China, it was perhaps more like the nervous system of a jellyfish. So very basic, very rudimentary, able to do some things. And what we see today is more akin to a human nervous system with a brain, with a spinal cord, uh, with a nervous system that really is quite sophisticated and able to do some remarkable things. And I think we're only at the beginning. So when we think about the emergence of a human nervous system, that only not only let individuals be more effective, but actually allowed society uh, to form and achieve things uh, collectively that were previously unimaginable. So I think uh, this is kind of what we're seeing in China today. And the digital transformation, uh, it's become a, a, a basic part of the Belt and Road Initiative as well. It's a major part of the overall strategy now. I mean, can you talk about the digital Silk Road and how this approach is actually helping other countries as well? Absolutely. So, Mike, we can think about this as having a couple of layers or, 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 or what well, in the tech world they call a technology stack. So there's hardware, um, which includes things like Chinese smartphones, uh, 5G servers, uh, telecommunications networks, et cetera. And then in the middle, we have, uh, we could think of it as middleware. So operating systems like Huawei's Harmony, uh, standards, payment systems, and then on top we have the applications. So we look at the digital Silk Road and one of the most important drivers is of course trade. So the ability to buy things uh, using your smartphone, using uh, a laptop computer uh, across countries is an enormous boon, uh, not just at a macro level, but for many SMEs. So you can see all across uh, the digital Silk Road in places like Pakistan, uh, Africa, the ability to get online, to sell things regionally, even globally, uh, really is transformative, uh, especially for those uh, in the global south. Andy Mock, always a pleasure. Thanks so much for your insights. Thanks for having me, Mike.